Greetings everyone, I'm Mar. Once again, this is my opinion, and I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas. It's that time of year, even though I'm not wearing a shirt that's festive for it. But hey, Nightmare Before Christmas is both a Halloween and a Christmas movie, so why can't I wear one that's for the other holiday? But, as you can tell from the title, I am reviewing a film that is considered by many to be a Christmas classic. And I'm going to say up until last night when I went and saw it in theaters. I had never seen this film before, even though, as I'll get into, it uh, is known in pop culture for a couple things. That, of course, is the 1946 film directed by Frank Capra and starring the legendary Jimmy Stewart, It's a Wonderful Life. Before I get too far into the video, just a reminder, if you want to support the channel, the Patreon link is down below. You join that Patreon. You will gain access to videos early, and you'll also be able to submit requests for future videos, whether reviews, topics, and uh, how many you will get is going to depend on the tier. Like the last uh, Patreon-related video that just went up was a Christmas one, and it was my review of the 80s comedy Scrooged. If you just want to do one-off for either a review or support, the PayPal link is also down below. It's a Wonderful Life. Now this film... Even if you've never seen it, there are a few aspects of the film that you will be aware of because of how much they're referenced in pop culture and parodied in pop culture. Probably the most notable thing is a line that's said at the end of the film by one of the children of Jimmy Stewart's character, and that is, Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. They reference that so many times. The one from my childhood that comes to mind is when they referenced it in Rocco's Modern Life. Daddy, Daddy, my teacher told me that every time a gas cap is found, an angel gets his wings. Your teacher's full of snot. Didn't realize that was what they were referencing until I heard that line the first time. And then, of course, the opening part of the film where it shows all the houses and people doing prayers over it. And the most notable parody there is uh, the one Christmas special of Beavis and Butthead were one half parodied the original Christmas Carol and then the other half parodied this. Beavis got the Christmas Carol, Butthead got the It's a Wonderful Life treatment. Of course, that one takes the story and throws it on its head that instead of wanting to save someone's life, the angel there is tasked with... Now, the film is adapted from a 1944 short story called The Greatest Gift. And it's a short story, so if you have seen the film already, one question you're probably asking right now is, how much of the story that's in the film is taken from its source material? And from that, it, and how faithful is it? Now, from what I managed to gather, only the last part of the film and what Bailey's going through is taken from the short story. And the rest is added in to give context of what's going on. And if you watch the film, whether you know that before or after, the f structure of the film makes a little bit more sense with that. That it's like, huh, we could do it a different way. But it also works to show the audience the character of George Bailey at the same time that the angel character Clarence is learning. By the way, Clarence, he's not named that in the short story. He's just called The Stranger from what I managed to gather, which kind of works for that medium. But for a visual medium, giving him a name fits. Now the plot is it's Christmas Eve and the film opens with many people throughout the town praying for a man named George Bailey. He's had a bad night. The prayers go up into heaven. And Joseph goes and speaks with God. Now, the film does not clarify that this is God, but from the fact that he's going up to the man, well, it's like Star's thing, and talking to him with respect like a subordinate would to a supervisor, it's God. The only other person it could probably be is Jesus, and they would refer to him by name, so not giving him the name, it's God. And he's telling them, hey, George Bailey's having a good night. We're getting a lot of prayers for him. Oh, yeah, 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 this is his big night. Other hint that it's supposed to be God, because God's all-knowing, all-powerful. And they decide, yeah, we're going to have to send an angel down there. And it turns out it's Clarence's turn. Now, this film goes with the whole thing of when you die and you go to heaven, you become an angel. Which seems to be a headcanon-y thing when it comes to these stories. Here it works, though. Because Clarence, he's been an angel for 200 years and he does not have his wings. Because angels have rank in the universe of this film and second classes don't have wings but first classes do. And he is trying to earn his wings. And he's not the smartest man this Clarence they make it out to be. He has the IQ of a rabbit but he has the faith of a child as God puts it. 
which it's like, really? That's not really the best thing in certain circumstances. True. But in a circumstance like this, where the person is very, very depressed and is about to go commit suicide. Now, they don't really say that word a lot in the film. They word it in other ways. But you can get what he's trying to do. I think part of the reason for that is the Hayes Code. And I think it allows the writers to do some creative dialogue writing to where you don't say the word. You have to figure out other ways to say it to make it work. It's like with that episode of Everybody Loves Raymond that I covered in that review series with the Halloween candy and the condoms. That they came up with ways to say condom without saying it so they can make it funnier. Like, things. I got things. I believe they say it at least once or twice in the film, but the rest of the time, I was like that. I wasn't taking notes about it during the film. You know, I watched it in theaters. Now, they sang Clarence down, but beforehand, they have to tell him, okay, this is who George Bailey is, and they literally show him George Bailey's life, and that's our introduction. We see him from when he was a Ute. He saved his brother's life when his brother was drowning in the winter, and because of that, he lost his hearing in one ear, which I do kind of identify with. I mean, I don't fully have hearing loss on this ear, but it is slight, and of course, this ear also does like to pop on its own, and like Mr. Bailey, it is water-related. Mr. Bailey, he had an ear infection from the water. Mine, it was swimmer's ear. Connection there. Bailey grows up. We see him as a teenager played by Jimmy Stewart, which is interesting because in this film, when he made it, Jimmy Stewart was 38, and here we're supposed to believe he's a teenager, which he looks pretty old for it, but I think it's the lighting and the makeup on it that makes you believe that he at least looks like he's in his late teens, early 20s around this time, so it works. And I think also the film being in black and white does help that a little bit more in color. It might be a little harder to sell that fact. It's like in uh, the later films we made with Hitchcock where we're supposed to believe this is a man in his 30s. And we're like, yeah, that's a man in his 50s. But Jimmy Stewart, he aged gracefully, so we buy it. We see that George Bailey is a man with dreams and aspirations. He wants to go see the world. He wants to go to college and learn how to be an architect. Or as he puts in dialogue, learn how to build things. Which is something that they pulled from real life, because apparently before he went into acting, Jimmy Stewart did go to school for architecture. Which is an interesting field. One of my former co-workers, he went for, for that, which I'm not going to get into that sidebar. That was an interesting conversation with him. Now, slowly but surely, those dreams and aspirations go down as... George has to settle with the reality first. His father has a stroke, so he has to help assist at the loan office that they do, which we do see in another flashback when he's a kid in between the Saving Brother incident in that where he saves another kid from getting poisoned at the drugstore he works at. Not a nice little moment. We see... We see that he has to do, he has to take over the business. Then he has to fully take it over when it's in danger of being bought out. And time and time again, he has to keep making sacrifices. But he does have some happiness. He does marry Mary, a girl that loved him from the time they were kids, and he ends up loving too. Which the scene when he has to finally admit that he does have feelings for her, ooh, the sexual tension there. And of course, it's sexual tension with respect to 40 sensibilities and how the writing is. It's something that. At the time, might have been seen as a little scandalous by people watching, like, ooh, the tension. But through a modern lens, you can still get the humor and see the stuff like she's like she's on the extension. Phew, I'm not. <laughs> stuff like that. And then when he finally does kiss her, which is an aside, this was Jimmy Stewart's first on-screen kiss following his service in World War II. And he was a little nervous during it, but he does pull it off in that scene. They get married, they have multiple kids, and things keep going. They hurt during the Depression, but he manages to pull them out from that. And it all goes well until the night that we joined them at the beginning. Because due to a little bit of tomfoolery involving taunting the film's antagonist, which I have not mentioned at all during this time, which of course is Mr. Potter, played beautifully by Lionel Barrymore. Mr. Potter is the businessman that you just love to hate. Before Montgomery Burns... Before a bunch of other businessmen, villains that we'd see in TV and movies, there was Mr. Potter. And unlike a lot of those guys, or like some of them in other cases, he does not get a comeuppance. Even at the end of the film, when there's a happy ending for George, as you could probably guess, since this is a Christmas movie with an angel, there is going to be a happy ending. Mr. Potter, 
No comeuppance for any of the stuff he does. On screen, at least. You could probably think with your imagination that maybe he gets it afterwards, but he doesn't. Now, the main reason I bring this up, because one, it's usual, unusual nowadays. You could probably guess a businessman not getting a big comeuppance. But at this time, due to the Hayes Code, it was very seen... It was, excuse me, it was seen as uncouth and unwanted that criminal activity on film go unpunished. They couldn't get away with impunity. And of course, here he does, on screen. Now what does he do? Well, he steals $8,000 that uh, George's uncle was supposed to put in the bank. And without this $8,000, they can't balance the books, can't pay creditors or whatnot. And it'll seem like someone was embezzling, and that's part of the reason George is in the shape he's in. Oh, we see it. And the scene where he finally breaks down all the stress going on him, James Stewart plays this perfectly. You really do feel for the man. I mean, he's letting it all out at the wrong place and to the wrong people, to his children and his wife, and you really see the hurt on their face. I mean, the kid actors playing his children are not the best. They're not going to be winning any awards. But there's good enough and there's a charm about it that you really believe that these are children whose hearts are being broken by the actions of their father, by him yelling at them, their outburst. All they're trying to do is be nice on Christmas Eve and make everything nice for him and calm him down, and he's just yelling at them. And you, Like the, the daughter that plays the piano, you really do see it in her face that, Daddy's yelling at me, I don't know what to do. I, I don't know what to do here. He's really hurting me. And when he realizes what he did, the look on Jamie Stewart's face, he's really selling it. He's one of the reasons this film works. The writing and directing by Capra do help it as well, and all the editing and the way the film is structured. But Jimmy Stewart's performance is the emotional core of this film and gives it the right amount of heart to why this film works and why even all these years later it's still considered a classic. Some would say it is overrated, which I will say I get with how often it's brought up. But with Jimmy Stewart's performance and the heart that this film has, you can see why it is brought up time and time again. And now once we get to the last part of the film, this is the part that most people talk about when they talk about this film. And that is the visit from Clarence, where Clarence is trying to change his mind from suicide. And he does it by jumping in the water to make James, his character, jump in to save him because... As we've seen in all the flashbacks, and as you probably get from how I've been talking about it, George is a man that a lot of times will put other people before himself. And that's the reason he's like that. That's the reason he's had all that stress. But he will give you the coat off his back. He will give you his own money to keep you out of the street, as we see during the Depression scene. He will work with you. I mean, he's not going to be making a lot of money like other businessmen in his in the loan profession will but he has a conscience. That's why you can see that this is a loose adaptation of a Christmas character, but it also inverses it. And it takes Scrooge from the beginning and Scrooge from the end and makes them separate characters. Scrooge from the end, of course, is George, and Scrooge from the beginning is Potter, and they clash. And here, George goes and saves a man, who is Clarence, and Clarence now has to save him. Because even after that, George is still having those tendencies. But even though some would say him killing himself is selfish, his whole plan is to do it for insurance money so the books will balance and his family will have some money even with him dead. As Potter tells him when he actually goes to try to borrow money from him, you're worth more dead than alive there, George. And the, the last part of the film is Clarence showing George that he is not worth more dead than alive. In fact, he's actually worth more alive and people are actually happy and in better positions because he existed. So he shows him an alternate reality where he was never born. Just for some other reason, his parents never had him. They had the younger brother, but they didn't have him. All the lives he's touched. The phrase butterfly effect is very apt here because we see how things would play if he wasn't there. His brother would have died, which that scene... When George sees his brother who died, seeing the tombstone, you can definitely tell that that part is influenced by A Christmas Carol. You know, the scene where Scrooge goes and finds his tombstone. Here, it's very, very reminiscent of that. And he sees it and he's like, no. And the th line that Clarence tells him, you weren't there to save Harry. Harry wasn't there to save those men because you weren't there to save Harry. Just the way he says it, as a matter of factly, and it's haunting. And Jimmy Stewart's performance again where he's like, no. 
then when he sees everyone else, what boat they would be in, where it would be Violet, the character that liked him but never married and never put the right moves on him. Everybody else in town and the fact that his wife would have been an old maid, a very bookish maid, without him in her, her life and seeing his mother, seeing everyone, it's like, everyone in this town would be worse off without me. It's not as bad as alternate reality Hill Valley and Back to the Future Part 2. It's like a couple steps down from that. But you can definitely see that Potterville, as the town is renamed, because no one was there to fight Mr. Potter, so he got his way every time. Not just nine out of ten of the, not just not at nine out of ten times. He got it ten out of ten times. So it's like, oh my God, things are worse for wear. And of course, it ends with him saying, "Yeah, life. I mean, we are the downside, but people are better for me." And when he goes back to his reality, he sees that yes, life is worth living. But he also sees, and this is going to be a major spoiler for those who haven't seen the movie. But he does see. That, and the way that he has touched the, the lives of everybody he's been with, they are going to pay it forward because they feel so touched. That they're going to go to bat for him, just like they, just like George went to bat for them time and time again. Whether it was to build houses, whether it was for loans, whether it was just being the guy to you know shoulder to cry on or give the coat off his back to them. And they give him money to help balance it. And this is another Christmas Carol connection here. But while listening to one of the songs from A Muppet Christmas Carol, this line stood out to me as a very fitting shorthand description of George's relationship with all the people in the town. And this end. If you need to know the measure of a man, you simply count his friends. It's very apt. Because the in- it's not everyone in town, but all the important people in town go to bat for him and bring him money. I mean, even his rich investor buddy, who's really more of an acquaintance, but they went to school, so I'll say buddy, even comes to bat with him and sends him money. And to the point where the guy <laughs> who's there to, to balance the books even throws some money in, and the cop that was there to arrest him on Potter's orders just gets the warrant and rips it in half. And it's a nice, very heartfelt, some would say over-sentimental ending, but... It works in the context of the film. And of course, it's a very heartfelt ending and is another one of the reasons why this film is considered a classic. Now, Capra's direction, he does a very good job with this film. And of course, there's two other classics around this time that he did, which one of them is Mr. Deeds Goes to Town and the other is Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which is another great film that he did with Jimmy Stewart. Of course, Claude Rains is also in that one. Now, that one's good because it has some political intrigue in there. His, the way he sets up the shots, the way he focuses, his mise-en-scene, that also adds to it. Especially the way he sets up the scene where uh, George is on the bridge or the scene where George is running through the snow. Merry Christmas! That whole part. Which, speaking of which, where did they use this fake snow in this film? They actually had to develop a whole new technique to do snow in this film because in the past they would use chopped up cornflakes that were painted white which of course if you've ever moved cornflakes that are not soggy you know they make a noise you drop enough of them it's going to be too heavy and you can't really use the onset dialogue but here Capra wanted to do that so the special effects people came up with a new one using fomite which was a firefighting chemical at that time soap and water and look on screen it worked worked so well that they were received a special Oscar for the development so go film even without everything else worthy of a praise for its place in cinematic history. And I thought this was kind of funny, and I didn't, I'm surprised I didn't notice it at the time, but this moment just seems too perfect to have been scripted, and of course it wasn't. When Uncle Billy walks off screen drunk, and then you hear the sound of something falling, and him going, I'm okay. That was an ad lib, because apparently while doing that take, a crew member in the back dropped something, and it sounded enough like if someone were to walk into some trash cans, fall over on the big metal sound. And, of course, Uncle Billy's actor was quick-witted like that and came out with that. Capra liked that take so much that he used it in the final cut. And he gave the team member who dropped the items a $10 bonus for improving the scene. So it goes there. Sometimes accidental genius is the best type of genius. And it worked for that scene. Which you can tell from that, there is humor in the film. Most of it is in the first half of the film. 
There is some in the latter half of the film, like when they make fun of the whole bell and you'll get to swing thing when they go into the bar and he like keeps the bartender keeps pushing the button. I'm giving out I'm giving out wings. Which of course it mostly has that little sarcastic tone there, but that's to match the world. But a lot of humor in the front half does work. Some of it might seem a bit dated as sensibilities wise, but if you can get into the forties mentality of the film, it'll work for you. And of course, I've already mentioned the acting, Jimmy Stewart, Lionel Barrymore, the other cast, Donna Reed does a great job as Mary, which of course she does. She has great acting chops. I mean, a few years after this, she would win the Best Supporting Actress Oscar for From Here to Eternity, which is another film that's on the list to watch from this era. She has great on-screen chemistry with Jimmy Stewart. You believe them as a married couple at different points because at the end, they've been married for at least a decade plus, whereas at the beginning, they're courting. You do believe the romantic and sexual tension between them, especially when uh, Jimmy does not want to admit it, <laughs> where he's getting all flustered. I don't know why I came here. I just want to get warm, that's all. And as you can tell by how much I've been praising this film, it does come with the more stamp of approval. If you are not fortunate enough to see this film for the first time on the big screen like I was, there's no harm in watching it on the small screen. It was only by happenstance that I got to see it on the big screen. It was a nice one and was one of those luxury theaters sitting there. The only thing that kind of was surprising for me is I didn't know the first part of the film before we got to The Angel was as long as it was. But considering that most of that was added to the story and the screenplay phase, I could see why. But it does make the latter half where we're seeing what life would be like without George make more sense. Have more of that thematic depth but if you can watch it, definitely give it a watch. Probably I'd recommend looking for a DVD or Blu-ray copy. But if you can watch it on VHS or just watch it on TV in whatever form, give it. It definitely is a film to watch on Christmas Eve. Although you can watch it any time of year. But due to its message and its whole vibe, it definitely is a perfect Christmas film. Till next time, guys.